Our next topic, the heritage of COVID-19, millions of unemployed in our country, thousands of people sleeping on the streets, and so many people going hungry every night. An economic and social disaster looming. A potential time bomb as well. The only way forward is economic development, and it is important to kickstart the economy to create jobs so people can work, and once people work, they earn money. It's a very simple formula, and after that, they can feed their families. To discuss this very vital and very important topic, it's my great pleasure to have two guests in the studio today. First and foremost, I'd like to welcome a very prominent businessman and philanthropist, Mr. Solimir. Assalamu alaikum, and thank you very much for being here. Satabba, thanks for having us here. It's an absolute pleasure. And secondly, uh, a person that I go back many, many years, we did our primary school education together. Well-known businessman, Mr. Mushtaq Bray. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. Thank you very much for having me here today. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Shari can I pose the first question to you? Sure. And it's a saying that we've heard so many, many times over, but it's so apt and relevant today. A hungry man is an angry man. Your comments? You are so right, Satarabha. Uh, you know, we must understand one thing very clearly, and sorry I take up your time, but we have to look at it in the context it is. For the first two, three hundred years, we had colonization, which ensured that all people of color were deprived of everything. It was also a form of keeping people hungry. Then we had apartheid, which really enforced everything, made sure people of color were moved out, never to come back again to the around the seas and the mountains, and these were all man-made. But COVID-19 is where the change comes in. Mm -hmm. This is when we realize that it's no more man that carries it, and it's a creator above that has the final say over everything. And with this change, we have come to realize that when you take away the dignity of a person and he's unemployed and he cannot feed his very own family, then you realize that we are in deep trouble. COVID-19 has become a change that the world won't be the same again. We realize very, very clearly now that so many more are unemployed, so many more won't be employed, but it's no more the bottom that will suffer the most, it's right across. You will see that the airlines are gone, Pilots are unemployed, and this goes right through the whole sector. It has no color, it has no barrier, but the marginalized will keep on suffering. And as the marginalized are suffering, and really there's nothing really being done because they even have to worry where the UIF is coming from, where their monthly uh, grants are coming from, they have to suffer with everything. They've had two choices. Either they go into lockdown and not die from COVID, or they die of hunger if they don't go back. Yeah. And that is the changing point. The world won't be the same anymore, so that well, we can see it. Mm -hmm. We are going into an era, a very clear era, which we'll call the new norm. It's got nothing to do with wearing masks or social distancing, which we'll have to carry out. But there will be so many more people marginalized and won't have food on the table. Then you can understand why people get angry, will be angry, and we will see, it will even create more criminals, not because they want to be, but because there is a need for it. Mr. Bay, if I can pose the next question. Yes, sure. um, looking at it from an economic point of view, whether it's microeconomic or macroeconomic, uh, I think an important question as the point of departure today would be, how bad is our economy at the moment and are we doing enough to revive it? Well, let's just start. When COVID was first announced in South Africa, in the world, and we went in our first lockdown in March this year, I think it was March 27th, by that time we were already in a recession. So that's the starting point. We were in a negative territory already at that stage. So the economy was broken. You know, and then to add on to that, we then had the lockdown, which completely locked down everything. It stopped exports of a lot of our commodities out of this country. It stopped people who, uh, working. Some people have lost their jobs, others have gone on short time. If you look at the tourism industry, there's been 400,000 jobs that, are, that have been lost at the moment. So millions of people have been left without a job. And I told him, I said, your job is your dignity. You can put the food on the table for your family. You get the respect of the children and that type of thing. Now once that goes, and it's been across the board, you can check with our GP population, you know, the general practitioners. 
the medical aides have not been paying them. They haven't seen patients. People have been afraid to go to the hospitals. People have been afraid to go to surgeries for their normal coughs and, 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 and that checkups and that type of thing. The net benefit of benefactors of being the big medical aid societies, uh, early in April and May, the net cash flow per week was more than a billion rand. Because people were not going to see the medical practitioners which they would normally have done. I haven't gone for my normal checkup this year. And a lot of other people haven't gone for their normal checkups or their dental checkups. So there are people who are scoring big time? Absolutely. It's a zero sum game. But we need to get the positioning right again. We need to say this is our new norm. What is happening to the world? Not, to, not just to South Africa, it's happening to the world. And how are we going to restate and how are we going to restart the economy of the world? And the only thing we can really do is we have to look at the micro, micro things. And I believe we should be using places like, like your forum, for instance, to, to promote this. I mean, the mosque should become the new center point of economic affairs as well, not just religious affairs. You know, we should know around here how many unemployed electricians there are, how many unemployed mechanics are there, how many unemployed any technicians there are, right? And we should have a register. So if my fridge is not working at home, I could phone the mosque and say, look, have you got an unemployed technician on your, on your, on your list that I could contact to give him a small job at least to do? I mean, that way we can restart the economy. It's going to have to be at the micro level. All of us will have to talk and say, how can we do things differently? The new norm is not going to be what we did for the last number of years. I say that we need to start climbing the ladder once more again. We're underground and we must start by. We're not in the South, we're not, we're, because people are drowning. People are drowning in debt. You'll be shocked to know if you go check with the banks. How many people are not able to pay their bonds at the moment or pay for their cars and all those type of things? Yes. The numbers are, are staggering. Uh, you know, the banking reporting segment is happening in the last few weeks. And all those banks have reported bad things that they've never heard about. Yeah. You know, this is the one in a hundred year event, by the way. You know, when we sit on a bank board, they ask you, uh, the, the, the analysts and the actuaries do stuff, and they say it'll be a one in a hundred year event. When I sit on the bank board, I said, don't tell me that, man. I'm not going to live for a hundred years. <laughs> but we've seen it now. Yeah. So anyway, if I can pose the next question to you, um, um, uh, thinking exactly what, what Mushtaq has mentioned now, what would you say, Salibai, with, with the experience you've got in business and uh, serving on so many organizations and uh, financial institutions, what would you say is the role of small business, and I emphasize small business, in our economic revival? And, and the second part of the question is, are financial houses doing enough to assist them? Salibai, you know, one thing you can't take away who are the real employers, whether in good times, bad times, any time, it is a small business. For an example, if you take Kentucky or you take any other restaurant or anybody, they employ people. Every 10 or 15 or 20 people are employed. And if you take and quantify that over three or five or 10,000 restaurants, then you will realize that they are the ones that are doing the employment, not the big uh, mega corporations yeah. or government. They're not the employers. The real work is created by the small business. But you must bear in mind that has also rapidly changed now. Small business has been very badly affected. Now, you know, we are at the moment talking of COVID and ravages of COVID. In South Africa, we have a second hidden COVID that's hitting small businesses like you have never known, and that is the lack of power. By ESCOM not functioning, oh, okay. yeah. I mean, they are totally destroying every essence of business. You know, there are small businesses that go in the morning and find because of load shedding, their fridge was burnt out or something was gone apart. I mean, they're barely making to make ends meet and keeping employed employees employed. And now these are added values. So when you look at the second thing that has come about with load shedding, which is adding even more pressure to what we got. But never, never get away from it. The real employment starts right at the bottom. And then it goes from there, and of course there's a chain, there's the delivery, and there's a, everything that follows after that. Your second question, have banks done enough? Absolutely not. I mean, I know it, I had a lot of people that call us, and we deal with it. The banks are living in their own world. They know the clients they have to help, the others they don't have to. Government came about with a 200 billion rand package that would be helping the people. 
not even 20 or 30 billion of that has been given out and we are five and six months down the line. They are still using the old norms to decide who gets it, who doesn't get it. So my direct answer to you, the banks and the institutions have not done enough. Mr. Why would you agree on it? Totally. Totally. I mean, the, the exact amount that's been given out so far is uh, between 13 and 17 billion out of 200 billion. But if you have a textbook, it's the same textbook. But the world has changed. You can't use the same credit book. Sure. It's going to have to be different. Yes. You're going to have to relax the rules to allow people to get an extra why fund. Why do you say that's the case? I mean, why is there this continual ongoing reluctance? Well, it's, it's, it's the banks want, you know, out of the 2008 financial crisis as well, the banks worldwide make lots and lots of money. Why is the New York Stock Exchange at one of the highest points at the moment? Because credit is cheap over there. You know, you can, you can get money for 0.1% in US dollars or, or 0.2% in US dollars. So people are borrowing and putting it in the sh stock market hoping it will go up. But I mean, that's the issue. And then also you must bear clearly in mind that the so-called 200 billion is guaranteed by the government. government. It's, it's not the bank's money. Not the bank's money. I mean, they are only the catalyst to give it out. Absolutely. Right. But if they're reluctant to give out money that the government has given, then there's something dramatically or drastically wrong. Yeah. And you know, you should ask the question six mm -hmm. months later, if you only dished out 20% or 10%, then something is amiss. But again, what is Treasury doing about it? Yeah. What is government doing about it? I mean, it's not only the banks that yeah. we should be blaming. Every day you hear of the huge corruptions, yeah. which are all added to this, please. And at the same time, while they try and take the decoy and put this corruption at the forefront, government should be playing a role. They should come and say, what has the bank dispersed? And they're not doing that. And that is why the smaller business and the medium to large are really suffering. suffering. Yeah. Mr. Bhai, um, our borders are closed. There's no international um, flights coming in or going out of the country. Um, the question of promoting the domestic market well, I think uh, promoting the domestic market is very important, but I mean, just getting back to your earlier uh, point now about the fact that you talked about the international borders being closed. Yeah. We are net exporters in certain areas, including the motor industry, motor cars and all that type of thing. That's been a backlog. We are net exporters of some of our raw materials. Right. That's not going up. But there are not enough cargo planes flying out of our country on a daily basis. We couldn't send out our abalone to the Far East because there were no cargo planes flying out. We couldn't send out a live lobster to the Far East or to China and that type of thing. So it's affected those areas as well. We couldn't send out our fish hike overnight to the markets in Europe where there was still a market, a different market, not the restaurant market anymore, but the normal retail market which we found, right? But there weren't enough planes. So th that's affected us as well, right? And now we're international borders. I mean, we know in the Western Cape, one of the primary earners in, our, in the Western Cape is tourism. Yes. That's stopped been completely stopped. So how are we going to now turn around and say, how are we going to get local tourism going? I mean, the first thing we should all be saying is our next holiday is not going to be overseas. I'm going to have to convince Shalibah <laughs> and myself that our next holiday is going to have to be in South Africa. Yeah. Because, you know, we're going to have to support South Africa. I'm going to ask Mr. Little Kids not to take the guys to an exotic trip to, 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 to Iran or Turkey or whatever. Take the guys, you want to take them on Islamic trip, take them to Bacha Pir in Durban. Take them to the other bazaars. Take them to go see the big Turkish mod, uh, mosque in Midran. Really good. I mean, since you're with me, go up the coast uh, to, to, to Mosul Bay. There are bazaars in Mosul Bay as well. Yeah. You know, we're going to have to get back. and We're going to have to have a change in mindset. All of us would love to go back to Medina and Makkah. I accept that. Sure, sure. But in the meantime, we have to get our local economy going, right? And I'm not going to accept that if we do it with the right intention, right? That we need to get those people back to work. A lot of my friends are golfers, I mean. They started playing golf again. We should challenge them. If you can afford to play golf, you should be able to afford to take a caddy with you. Don't to carry a bag. We would have got a, a trolley for your bag. When I take a caddy, you're putting food on the caddy's table. We should insist on that. You know, there's simple, simple things that we can start doing. W would you say that over the last couple of months, we, we are moving in that direction to promote the domestic market, tourism-wise, food, food production-wise? The well, food production was I think we've been forced into a part of the thing is with, with our rand going down against the dollar. Our input is all of a sudden caught a cold. You know, they, you know they, they, they're now selling stuff, they're buying this stuff at a higher price than they were selling it before. Yes. Because you know, your, your, your rand dollar went down 25% and you don't normally have that type of margins in a trading 
entity or in, in a commodity. So they've been caught with the, you know, uh, they'd be out of pocket. So they, they've been forced to look for local supplies as well. Yeah. You know, sorry, but why I'm talking about the domestic market is because if you take India as an example, uh, the tourism sector is a huge contributor Absolutely. to the yeah. GDP. Yeah. But the internal tourist uh, a portion of the tourism industry yeah. is huge. Yeah. Obviously, they've got you know, uh, 1.2 billion people and a lot of Indians want to also go and see the Taj Mahal just as much as Savage by Mushtaq and I would like to go and see the Taj Mahal. So when there is a bit of a slack in the, in the international market, the domestic market actually makes up for it. We've got Table Mountain, we've got Robben Island, we've got the Kruger National Park, the Garden Route is so beautiful. I don't think there can be a, a more beautiful route than the Garden Route. And yet, I feel that we've not done enough to promote our domestic market. Yeah, but, but, uh, but, but can I just tell you on that? Malaysia has given us an example now. You know what they've done locally? Yeah. They've given each local person who wants to go on a local holiday a, a voucher of the government. One day they it. It's not much, but it's something. So yeah, if you're going to go on a local holiday, the U.S. under three years, that's an example. I mean, in the U.S. in the U.S. in Philadelphia, you know what they've done there? They've come in. They called something called five, four, fifty. Five, four, four fifty. Yeah. Please spend five dollars, right, for fifty days at the local shop. Okay, okay. You know, it's simple programs. Yeah. Can you imagine what that would do to your shops around this area, around the mosque? So, once again, it's a change in mindset. Absolutely. We're going to have to go back to basics. Yeah. Forget about the big textbooks, the big textbooks. Yeah. It's not going to help us in this case. You, so yeah. you know, you must bear in mind that's the same thing that England has done. Not only it's the furlough, but they've allowed people to go out to a restaurant first three days. <laughs> and 50% uh, of the bill will come from the government yeah. up to oh. 10 pounds. Yeah. 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 In the first yeah. five months or four months of opening up, there were 64 million people that used it. It cost the government 640 million pounds, but that again got the restaurants going. No. But for the last two months, you couldn't get space in a restaurant because everybody wanted to use that incentive or you know, 90 percent of it. That's so you have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. But yeah. you see, again, we must understand that all our travel people have also been spoiled by overseas tourists. Yeah. When they come to the pound, it's 22 to 1. When they come to the dollar, it's 17 to 1. So for them to, they have engaged and arranged that all the uh, rates are based on the dollar, yeah. no more the rent, yeah. which makes it very difficult for domestic people to keep up with that. No. Okay. But COVID has changed okay. it. Because now they have also realized that if we don't lower our rate or we don't do something, then we are out of business. Do you know, uh, by that I know of people that were top end hotel managers? First two months they had to take a 50% cut in their pay. Now most of them are no more in their jobs. Do you know that six months ago you would not get space in a private school? Today is you how many spaces you want because people can't pay their school yeah. fees, they cannot pay their bonds, they are unemployed, they're moving their children out. This is a game changer. And this is a time for us, in retrospect, to see that we really need so little to live, enjoy, and do what we want. And this has also been a great changer that it's brought family together, it bonded Absolutely. family together. Absolutely. So there have been a lot of pluses. Pluses, no, 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 no doubt about it. It's also taught us that our our needs of you are wants so many. Yes. Absolutely. So we buy many of us, and I'm sure you start by with the degree of me. Are aware that you have your lips sometimes very close to the ears of people high up in the corridors of decision making. Oops. Um, <laughs> do you take your advice? No, I think that's a total perception. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why you get to the case. I promise you, I would have shouted in every year, no corruption. <laughs> I know you don't have no shitting. <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't worry. That is not the case. Look. Uh, you must bear in mind with most of the ministers and people that are, I mean we grew up together, 
in the struggle. We've been all rich together. We've been brothers together. <laughs> and and in, that doesn't change. You know, uh, like we know each other, we know them intimately, but at the end of the day, they make the final decisions. Yes, we have access where you can talk to them. No, that's what I'm saying. No, but, but, but we don't talk to them. We don't need to give them advice. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, if they need something, it's fine. But otherwise, no. You know, at the end of the day, that's their role. But you can see from what's carrying on at the moment that all of us here sitting, we all desire for things to be normal. Exactly. We cannot accept the corruption. Yeah. We cannot accept everything is overlooked. We cannot accept the fact that people are not charged. We cannot accept that people working in government are not even fired. You know, and, and uh, as long as all that goes on, it will be very difficult. I can also tell you at this stage, we are very lucky, as much as we might be disappointed, that we have a leader like President Ramaphosa there. Just turn your mind back three years and if you have that leader, then you can imagine where he would be today, yeah. okay? So let's be thankful of the small things. I mean, we must also understand that he is trying to balance everything. But of course, we as human beings want action. We want things to happen. And that's what we demand, that look, as much as we support you, as much as we with you, but now we want to see action because we cannot allow what has happened. Now, you know, everything is again disguised about COVID and all the corruption that goes in COVID. We've forgotten that corruption has not been something new. No. It's from timely memorial. Absolutely. But now it's exposed. And the real people that have benefited from it, the major corporations, they are all part and parcel of it, but nobody talks of it. I even remember the World Cup corruption. Yes, now, 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 if we were there, there was the major uh, building companies, you know, they all colluded. Yeah. But you even forget that 15 years ago, Tiger Brands and all of them colluded in the price of bread. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. was that is from the hungry, from the poorest yeah. of the poor. So all that has been clouded with what's happened with COVID-19. But uh, corruption is here, everywhere, and across the globe. Don't fool yourself. But we demand that that should come right and quickly. So uh, you are saying that we should move forward, we should be positive, and that we should all work together to see that things are going to unfold in a far better way for everybody. The one thing that nobody can take away from us is hope. The day you lose hope, and the day you're not positive, your life goes backwards. Okay. We know there are a lot of negatives, don't get me wrong. But each negative has got a flip side. And let's look at that positive and together make a difference. As Mr. Bai was saying earlier, so many unemployed, how do we aid on to bring dignity to them? How, you know, it's all well going giving out food parcels, which we must do. Well, no, maybe, because that is our sadaka, that is our lila, everything. That we good to do, whether we like it or not, and it must be across the board. But that is just the beginning. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of other things we can do. As I told you, when a man is unemployed, and when a man loses his dignity, then he's, he's, he's got nothing more left. Yeah. And that is the point that we must work on, work on quickly, be positive. I think at the end, if we believe in our Creator, which we all do, things will get better. Inshallah. We don't know when, but yeah. Inshallah, you know, the Almighty has said, I will not put a burden greater than you can bear. Absolutely. And with that positive mind, I just like to look at the positives. And at the same time, I don't discard the negatives because I want those things to come right. Inshallah. Mustafai, one question to you. Uh, you've been uh, a very long time in business, uh, having, alhamdulillah, a, a number of large companies sit, uh, sitting on many boards and so on. Uh, the question is, are you optimistic of a quick turnaround? Uh, in certain areas, the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, if I can give you two quick examples, and I think it might just bring it out, and it's both related to ourselves. We're quite big in the fishing industry. We've got shares in Oceana and in Sea Alves. The two of the big fishing companies in South Africa. If we can get our transport going again, our international transport going again, if we could send out fresh fish overnight again, every night, if we could send live lobsters out again every night, there are planes going out, take it out. We can quickly turn that around. Okay. And that hasn't been too bad at the moment because they were essential services. They were operated during the whole period. 
Mohammed uh, see how the results came out this week, and were very positive. We were equal to last year. Now in the bad time, including with additional COVID costs, I said that's a great result. Well well the fact that it could keep four and a half thousand jobs going, and the strange thing was, it was strange that our staff at some of those places like Oceana and see others came back to us and said, look, can't we pack four parcels to our neighbours? We've got no jobs. Oh. And, they, and our, you know, absenteeism rate during this period went down. People were so lucky and happy that they've got a job. Whereas if I take on the other side, House of Manatic, wasn't seen as essential services. Got 540 jobs at stake over there at the moment. Nobody's buying new clothing. I haven't bought a pair of socks for the last six months. Any clothing? <laughs> you know, no, that's an issue. It's an issue. It's an issue. Yeah. So how do you get that going? Uh, I think next year when people buy, they think they've got a 2021 design. It's really 2020 that will be on the market. They love it in the shops. That will be renamed 2021. As that, so that might take a bit longer. So you've got those two issues, you know. Yes. Uh, and, and we're going to take the best out of everything. Sure. And make sure. Look, I can just give you one quick story about the old Germany. After the Second World War, a lot of people thought that machinery made in Germany was the best in the world. It was made in Germany. And it was of a good quality. But quite often it was not made by a multinational world in Germany. It was being made in a garage by a few individuals. Yeah. We worked at home as engineers and producers and was made in Germany. So the world border was being made in Germany. And we have to go back to that. Yeah. Go back to basics. And it also reminds me of Vietnam that was bombed about 25 years ago. Yes. Yeah. And um, um, until recently, it was, it was one of the best performing economies in the world. Yeah. You, you must bear in mind what Mustafa Bhai has now said. That you know, even today, today, when you look at the top, top uh, institutions in Derm uh, Germany, for example, watchmakers, they still have their little wheels yeah. being done by homes. No, I don't they know. still have the cases made at home. So when you see the finished product, it's not the finished product that you think is coming out of one. And, and you know, I learned something in Hong Kong 30 years ago. I in order to create employment, they employ people by saying, how many watches are you going to do? Not how many hours you're going to work. And how many watches are you going to produce? You know, in those days they had the digital watches. Yes. Yes. And for every watch they were given a percentage of it. In that way they created employment and they created volume and mess. And incentive. And incentive. So those are, and, and also while we had the topic, you know, and Mustaq by is an opportunity, you know, it was 1994-95 Mustaq we spoke about brimstone. Yes. And you know, all of us from the ground yes. got it going. Yeah. And today we must be proud, it's the only BEE and the only company listed on the stock exchange, you know. But then, looking at the bigger corporations, let's not fool ourselves. I can give you 20 names now, 20 names, whether it's Woolworths, whether it's Truworths, whether it's Old Mutual, everyone took billions out of the country, lost a trillion rains mm -hmm. and came back. Nobody talks about that. We started from the bottom, we created, we created the work. These guys took our money, went to invested overseas and got a hiding of their life. No. I worked out the other day, it's close to a trillion rains. If not more. Now then you realize that we are starved of a lot of things. And until they realize that the first priority must be at home. At home. Look at what we've created, what a past we've inherited. But they run overseas and they get a hiding. But anyway, at the end of the day, again, I say, let's look at the positive okay. side and we like it up. One final question to both of you, knowing the background of both Salibai and Mushtarbai, the importance of philanthropy, especially in these times. I, I, I think philanthropy is something that's not for this time. Philanthropy is an ongoing thing. Okay. But if you go back 30 years, you know, and we were very small and used to give one bursary to somebody, that made a difference. It started everything. But every time and every age has had a need for it. The need was the same in 1986 when you know we had the riots. I mean, people had no food. I know in Venda when we did the work, there was no water, Satarbai. From 1974 uh, to 82, we were only putting barrels, which by the way work up to today. Huh? Yeah. Okay. So it, 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 uh, uh, philanthropy is an ongoing thing. What has happened with COVID, the need is greater. Okay. And we're doing more and more and more. But again, what is philanthropy? 
it comes from the Almighty. Yeah. We are only used as catalysts yes. to do the work. And we must be grateful yeah. that we've been given the opportunity to touch life. Yeah. Well, if I could add on to that, I'm going to tell you about myself, we work together on a lot of these things, right? And we've got such a close work relationship. You told me and I told him, and we don't ask each other questions, that's how much. That's that's the way we work on and we for many years. Saliba says and the Saudi Ashford Relief Fund with me as well. For for many of years now we've been going, we've gone across the board, given to everybody. We haven't said it's an Islamic institution or anything like that. It's you it's an institution for humanity. That's the big thing. And the other big thing which you can also learn from that as well. We do fortunately we've structured it in a proper way. We've got a, we we give people section eighteen A certificates that can claim back from the tax. We've also registered for some people like that. So on an annual basis now we get about half a million land back in VAT, which we give out again in, in form of aid. Wonderful. So you have to do it correctly and we've got the ability within our people, in our communities, to do things properly. All, all the expertise. Yeah, it's, it's there. We've got so much technology expertise within our uh, community, so many legal, so many accounting skills, tax skills. That's all there. It's a matter of we need to utilize, and I'm coming back to the fact that I think we need to utilize our mass as that as a, as a melting pot, as a focal point, point, and turn it away from being only a Jumaat in the lecture place, a place where you can make a five times salah. It's going to be where everything happens from. It must be the nerve center of the community. Absolutely, and I think Siddhartha with yourself here, Mr. Rukuzi, you've done a great job. You know, I, I saw the mosque being built when my office is over next day. Okay. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I saw it being open and everything, so I mean, I've got a long relationship with the place, you with me? And you've done an absolutely phenomenal job. It's, a, it's an icon in our area, it's an icon in our country now. Thank you. But unless, yeah. unless you can use that to serve humanity, you have failed the people of South Africa. And that's the challenge I've given you. And Sadaf, I have to add on, you know, and you are well aware of it. Not only do we care for South Africa, you know, through the well, World well, well, Organization, we care for it globally. <laughs> and then we have no race, no, no gender, gender, we care yeah. for mankind. And you know, it's, you can't change the world. Mm. But every life that you touch, touch is the difference that you make. Yeah. And I must add on with what uh, Mustafa is saying. We've been involved with uh, your mosque and many others here. And you people have done a phenomenal job. I've never seen, and I've mentioned it to you, a team so well organized for every event, for every occasion, for every year. You've just handled it superbly. And you as chairman and to your trustees and everybody here, Mubarak, keep on with the good work. Mm. You are our inspiration. <laughs> thank you so much, Saliba. I really appreciate that. And on that wonderful note, I'd like to thank Mr. Salim Rua. Affectionately known to everybody as Uncle Sali, but to me as Salim Hai. As well as Mustak, thank you so much for having us just seen you after, after a very, very, very long time. And uh, I'd like to wish both of you all the best. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. much. And, thank you. And, thank you. And, and, and one thing, carry on with the Sunday Forum, we enjoy it. Thank yeah. you so much, thank I really you. appreciate that. Okay. That was our discussion today on how to kickstart the economy, getting people back at work, people can earn money, feed their families, and try to uh, uh, soften the blow in terms of the ravages of COVID-19. Wonderful discussion, uh, discussion we had with Mr. Salim Rue and Mr. Mushtaq Bey, giving us a very insightful and positive contribution in how to change the mindset and kickstart the economy to create more jobs, more people can work, more people can earn money and put food on the tables of millions of people in our country.